the subject of potluck and love feast came up, I began to think about different combinations of maybe a, what pot, pot love or pot, I, I don't know, um, pot feast. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's all kinds of different things you could come up with, but uh, anyway, um, it's always a, a time that we gather together and we enjoy fellowship, so. Uh, let's uh, let's pray as we begin this morning, Lord. We uh, we quiet our hearts before you today, and we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together as your people. We seek you this morning. We're not here to be entertained. Um, we're not here for. Um, anything other than seeking you. That's what our, our heart desires. So we do ask, Lord, that uh, you would be very present through your Holy Spirit in these moments. We pray, Lord, for our kids as they're downstairs. We ask, Lord, that uh, that they would have an encounter with the, with the living God, just as much as we do up here. Uh, thank you for Wes, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless him as he leads our kids. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Okay, difficult question that we start with this morning. Does anyone remember much of the sermon I preached two weeks ago on Palm Sunday? Oh, we have some nodding heads. That's good. That's good. I know, I know, I was going to say, you know, I know that sermons can actually be quite forgettable. Um, and I'm sure I've preached plenty of those. Um, but of course, sometimes sermons aren't forgettable. And, um, you know, that's just a, a part of the way that things are. Uh, sometimes we walk out, we remember everything. Sometimes we walk out, don't remember anything from the uh, sermon at all. I, but I don't know if you're like me, but I will often remember at least what we sung in church. And in fact, um, um, you know, oftentimes we will go home and the kids will be singing the songs that we have sung during the morning service and they're singing the same one over and over and over throughout the whole week, which is, can be annoying, I know, but it's also quite a blessing. Um, but sometimes though, we will actually get home and we'll talk about the sermon. Um, uh, Especially if, uh, if there's been some, you know, interesting or difficult or challenging things about the sermon. And that's a good way to think about and process what we've heard. But I digress. Um, I really did want to know if anybody remembers the sermon uh, from Palm Sunday. And not just so that I know that you listened to what I actually had to say. Well, maybe you don't remember everything, but the main point was that we make Jesus in our own image just like the Israelites did. And I, I just, they wanted, they wanted Jesus, the Israelites wanted Jesus to be something that he had not come to be. And in fact, they ignored things that Jesus said that indicated to them that he was not going to be what they expected. So it got me thinking about ways in which we make Jesus into our own, own image. If the Israelites could do it, well, why not us? I mean, it's pretty obvious. We're just as human as they are. So what ways do you think we make Jesus into someone he is not? Or, or maybe it would even be better to broaden the question a little bit. In what ways do Christians actually distort the kingdom of God. And we could talk about the ways that non-Christians distort the kingdom of God and their misunderstandings about who God is, but that, that's not really our task this morning. Let's keep it in-house. Let's keep it in the family. I think it's appropriate to broaden things like this because Jesus is our king and his kingdom should reflect his character. I'd love to hear some, some of the things you are thinking after the service. Okay, we'll, we'll, keep it, we'll keep it to at least my impressions this morning. Um, but I would love to hear some of those things after the service. But here are a few ways that we tend to get God wrong. 
God is the old man in the sky. You ever, have you ever thought that or you ever heard somebody say that? This is a caricature of God that is not particularly helpful because God is not man nor is he old. We can't even use that word old. Why can't we use old? Because he's actually timeless. How, how do you attach young or old or any other kind of adjective to timeless? It's, he's just timeless. God is actually timeless. God is immaterial. God is personal. Personal. God is immensely powerful. And God is perfectly good. God is not created, nor is God like us. So how can we characterize God as an old man in the sky? That's just so limiting. Well, how about this one? I need to earn God's favor. I know that this is a little bit more like humanist on the human human side or the not humanistic but on the human side but we often think of God as this old man again going back to the first point of this old man just waiting for us to sin instead God simply invites us into a relationship with him where he frees us from sin to live life to the fullest there's nothing that we can do to earn God's love or earn the salvation God offers through Jesus. This is something that is actually unique to any religion. It's unique to Christianity. In every other religion, you have to earn God's favor. Christianity, no. You cannot earn God's favor. You cannot earn God's grace. He gives it freely. Well, here's one that might cause a firestorm if we really get into it, but I'm going to say it anyway. God supports my political party. <laughs> I listen to a podcast called Truth Over Tribe, and I, I really, if you're an American, maybe even if you're not an American and you're interested in American politics, it might be something you might be interested in. But it's, it's actually uh, done by a couple of American pastors and, and thus addresses mainly American issues in church and society. Their goal is to be faithful to scripture as they discuss political and relevant topics to today's world. In the intro to the podcast, there is someone saying that it's unchristian to vote or support the Republican Party. And then, right after that, it says, there's somebody that's saying it's unchristian to vote and support the Democrats. Clearly, these are both people who identify themselves as Christians. I don't think God affiliates himself with one party, as I think a Christian ethic comes into conflict with both parties and both platforms in different ways. That's the reality within which we live. So I think we misunderstand God if we think God supports a, a political party. There are a lot of ways that we could take scripture out of context to get it to say what we want it to say. Uh, actually, one of the passages I was considering preaching from this morning was Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. And, and it talks about the believers. It talks about the believers, that, that the church is just emerging, and, and what happens? They had everything in common and held no personal possessions. I can imagine that there are some who believe that this passage is prescriptive instead of descriptive. We know the difference between prescriptive and descriptive. Prescriptive is to say, this is how you should live. This is what you should do. Descriptive is just saying, this is what they did. This is, this is what happened. If it's prescriptive, we should all be socialists. What do you think about that? <laughs> if it's descriptive, the main point is that the early Christians decided to take care of each other, not out of compulsion, but just simply living out their faith in a radical way and doing it willingly. Personally, I think it's a, descript, uh, it's a, it's a descriptive 
way of looking at things. And, you know, today the church is also having to navigate issues of sex, sexual identity. That's, that's another area where, where, where the world is having this influence on the church. And there will always be cultural influences and pressure on the church, especially as Judeo-Christian ethics and values have less and less influence and place and prominence in legal and legislative bodies throughout the Western world. So you might be thinking to yourselves an obvious question. How do we navigate all this? How do we stay true to scripture? How do we stay true to God? How do we have, make sure that our beliefs about God and his kingdom are correct? And these are all good questions. And I hope that our scripture passage this morning will help us. This will help us. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1 this morning. And I'll be reading from verse 1 to the second verse of chapter 2. And what version is this? Does anybody know what version? NIV? Okay, I'm going to be reading from the ESV. So um, just be aware that there's going to be a little bit of a difference. So I'm going to be reading again from the first verse of 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 all the way to chapter 2 verse 2. So listen closely. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched their own hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was f with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. Now, one of the things that, that I, you know, I, I often try to do when I read scripture is, is, is I think um, this is a good practice for all of us, is to place ourselves somehow in the narrative of scripture. We, we have just celebrated Easter, and of course, Jesus is risen, and we celebrate that Jesus is risen. But if we think about going back and placing ourselves with the disciples and, and what they were experiencing, they haven't yet moved completely from this confusion and disappointment of the death of Jesus, despite the joy they experienced in his resurrection. I think that they're probably still kind of confused, trying to figure out what in the world are the implications of everything that just happened. The Holy Spirit hasn't yet come to, to birth the church at Pentecost. It's like the disciples are in this in-between space, in between the resurrection and the birth of the church. It's, it's almost as if Jesus has this time with the disciples to remind them of all of the things that he said and did before turning their attention to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. And of course, one of the other passages that I considered using this morning was actually one that, that Chad referred to last week when Jesus shows up to the disciples and says, Peace to you. 
He shows up in the room with them and actually he does it again because the first time Thomas isn't there. And so he shows up again because Thomas is like, "Uh, I'm not going to believe unless I see for myself. And then Jesus shows up and says, Thomas, go ahead and touch. Touch, show, see, see, touch. Just like we heard John just a minute ago. He said, you know, we touched, we felt, we saw. And here's Thomas saying, I need to see. And Jesus says, okay, I'll meet your need. But blessed are those who don't see yet still believe. So Jesus is spending time with his disciples. He's helping them once again to see the truth of what's happened and helping them process all of this. Now, this letter from John is not written in that in-between time. In fact, it is most likely that John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John while he was in exile on the island of Patmos late in his life. He was the only disciple who would not die a martyr's death, but he lived until at least 98 AD. And he would eventually die of natural causes in the city of Ephesus. So this isn't... This isn't like somebody has come along and said, okay, you know what, I'm going to take what I heard John say, and then I'm going to write all these letters in his name for his account. No, this is actually a disciple of Jesus who is saying, look, this is what I saw. These are the things that I touched. It's a little bit different than some of the, um, the ways in which we've been told about Scripture. Now, has anyone here watched The Chosen? Has, has anybody been, yeah, a few people? You know, as a family, we've watched the first three seasons, and, and we will hopefully soon watch season four. And, and what a powerful portrayal of Jesus' disciples in the gospel story. Um, I've been really touched. And my own personal opinion is that despite fulfill, fill, um, despite filling in, I've, I wrote fulling, I should have written filling. Despite filling in a lot of details that are not included in scripture, they have remained on solid theological footing. I, I, really, I really think so. Just like I would not use the message as a primary resource for theology and doctrine because it's a paraphrase, I would also not use, I'd be careful in using the chosen in that way as well. I see the chosen as a work that helps bring Jesus off the pages of scripture. It brings Jesus alive because he is alive. And of course, Let's recognize as well that we are in a, we're in a time where uh, we're very orientated towards the visual. You know, um, all of the social media stuff, we, we want to see things. We want to experience things. And, uh, and I don't think people are as orientated towards, towards reading these days. One of the things that I've appreciated to see in the the, the Chosen is Matthew is constantly taking notes of what Jesus is saying. We so often hear that the Gospel accounts were not written down until decades later, as that is somehow a problem. Disciples were students. And what do students do? Well, okay, maybe if you're not a good student, you're not going to take notes. But when a teacher teaches, students take notes. I did most of the time. And my kids do too. Uh, This letter of John itself is a first-hand account. Now, we uh, um, we often attribute these letters to one author, and rightly so. Some had to write someone had to write them down. So we know that there's an actual author, but that doesn't mean that there weren't other people that were involved in in actually what it says. I think it's safe to say that they not only had their memories of Jesus, but they also had their own notes. They also had each other, which means these accounts are not written in a vacuum. These accounts of Jesus and his teachings are accurate. They're reliable. We can trust them. Skeptics would like us to doubt that they are saying, uh, would like us to doubt 
that by saying that time elapsed between what the disciples saw and then it actually being written down is a problem. Thus, there are errors, there are embellishments, or it's all just made up. That's just not good logic. If you really think about it, it's not good logic. There is no book that has been more scrutinized, more studied in all of world history than the Bible. And if you ask scholars, the people actually study it in depth, they will tell you it's reliable. It's reliable. While I read this passage, one thing that jumped out to me this morning, one thing jumped out to me more than anything, and it kind of goes with what I've just been talking about. Verses 1 to 5 tell us something very important. Did you notice that John doesn't write these verses in the first person singular? Did you notice that? He actually writes them in the first person plural. He doesn't use I, he uses we. So let's read them over again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we look upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And what's the word of life? It's Jesus. The life made manifest. And we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and made manifest to us. That that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So here we are. John is just continually saying, we have heard. We have seen with our own eyes. We have looked upon. We have touched with our own hands. That's just verse 1. Verse 3, we have seen, we have heard proclaimed, and we proclaim it to you. And then verse 5, this is the message that we have heard. We're only just repeating it. And John is, is reminding us that he is not just writing about these things that he saw and experienced. He's writing on behalf of a group who saw and experienced Jesus. I think he's actually trying to say that even though I'm the one who is writing this, those of us who saw and experienced Jesus firsthand agree on who Jesus was and how we then relate to him. I know I still haven't answered the question that I started with way back when. How do we keep on track with Jesus and maintain orthodox beliefs with regard to who Jesus is and what his kingdom is about. It's like John actually is saying here over and over in so many words, we need to go to the source. We have looked to the source. We experienced the source. We heard the source. We witnessed Jesus. We heard what he said. We testified to it. We heard it from him directly. We need to go to the source. We need to go to Jesus. Well, you might say that's not easy. Jesus isn't here in the flesh right now like he was to John and the other disciples. It's a bit easier than you might think, though, as we have the inspired word of God. The whole volume. There's nothing missing. Scriptures are sourced to know who Jesus is and what he said. When we talk about Jesus in theological terms, we believe he is the full revelation of God in the world. We need to be careful and we need to be watchful of those who would try to teach doctrines contrary to what Scripture says. Those are people who would lead us astray. How would we know false doctrine unless we know Jesus and know his word? This is precisely what John is talking about in 1 John. In fact, he will go on to talk about false teachers. 
And so he's trying to help these new believers, these young believers. He saw in, in, in chapter 2, he starts off with, my little children. He's not telling them this because they're actually little children, like five, six, seven, and eight-year-olds. He's reminding them that they're young in their faith and that they need to go to the source. John then takes time to bring correct teaching to the believers. Now I'll admit to you that there is much more to say on this issue and, and, and we have an article of faith um, in the church on scripture and, and we have discussed, uh, Chad and I have discussed the possibility of a sermon series at some point going through all 16 articles of faith um, at some point. Uh, we haven't yet decided when, um, but... I, th I think it would be a really cool kind of series to go through and to, to spend time working through the Articles of Faith. So, you know, there is a right and a wrong way to read Scripture. And we need to s deal with subjects like context of Scripture, historical, cultural, and otherwise, as well as some of the ways Scripture should not be interpreted. There's a group of people that just want to see it at face value. We call them literalists. They see it for face value. Whatever's written there is exactly what is meant. You know, we don't have time to deal this morning and get into all of that, but we will eventually get to dealing with these matters in the months ahead. In the months ahead. But here's the, the, the last thought. And let me just remind you. This morning, we need to be reminded to go to the source. We need to go to the source. Let's pray together. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this morning and, and just for um, the fact that we were, are reminded, even by the Apostle John this morning, that... Your, your, your word is true. Uh, we... And it's reliable, and it's something that we can have trust in. Um, we thank you, Lord, for the fact that it, it, it is God-breathed. And we, we recognize, Lord, that, that um, there is there is truth in your word. And, and we thank you, Lord, that we can... We can look to Jesus through your word. And that, and that, that your word is there uh, 